I want you to take your Bible, turn with you to uh, turn with me to John chapter five, and I've got a verse bouncing around like Tetris in my mind, and uh, I'm not sure that I can. I'm not sure that I can find it. Um, Where is it, that verse? For it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this the judgment. Where is that verse? Am I thinking in the right direction when I'm thinking Romans? Or am I thinking something else? Somebody find that. We'll go to it here in a little bit. But uh, Jesus mentions the judgment. And I want you to be thinking about that tonight. Everybody, everybody in this room, Everybody listening to my voice, you're going to stand before God in judgment. In fact, everybody that, huh? Well, I was close, Hebrews and Romans. Um, Hebrews 9. That isn't where I thought it was, so that must be the wrong one. No, that's it. Um, let's back up a little bit. Hebrews 9, verse 24. For Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands. That means when that Catholic priest reaches in that, what they call a tabernacle, and pulls out that wafer, that's not Christ. And it never will be Christ, ever. Because he does not dwell in temples made with hands. And that, that tabernacle, what they call is what they call that box where the host resides. That tabernacle is, was made by the hands of men and God does not dwell in that. Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us, nor yet that he should offer himself often. Just like in the Catholic Mass, they, they re-crucify Christ, and they, re, and they say this, in a bloodless sacrifice. I'm sorry, but a bloodless sacrifice doesn't count either. doesn't matter how many times you do it. Uh, nor that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with the blood of others. For then must he have often suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die. And ask the question, how many times does Christ have to die for people's sins? Once. But according to the Catholic Church, and even those like um, Lutherans with their belief in consubstantiation, they are still re-crucifying Christ anew and bringing him to an open shame. And that's clearly forbidden in scriptures. As it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. And my friends, my brothers and sisters, and our Catholic friends who might be listening, that is exactly what the Bible says. And any time the, the Catholic priest will tell you that they're re-crucifying Christ again for new sins that have come up, that is, it's blasphemous is what it is. It is absolute blasphemy to make Christ suffer again for the sins of people. He's already done it once. Once was good enough when God does it. Amen? It's like saying that I, you got saved over again. I, I was saved, I lost my salvation, but I got saved again. In fact, I got saved three times last week. No, one time. Amen? John chapter 5, let's go to the Lord in prayer, ask His blessings. We'll pick it up in verse 19. Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you, Lord, for a beautiful day. We thank you, Lord, for the work that you've given into our hands. Lord, the labor, Father, that uh, brings forth the fruit, Father, of our labor, that feeds us. Keeps our house, Father, gives us clothes to wear, food to put on our table, supplies all of our needs. Lord, all of these things, God, that you have given to us as a blessing to us. And yet, Father, you've blessed even the lost man. 
Those that don't believe in you, those who blaspheme you, you feed them, you clothe them, you take very good care of them. You're a very, very good God, even to those who despise you. Now, Father, we thank you for being our God and for being so good to us. We thank you, Lord, for these old songs we sang tonight, that our debt is paid. And we thank you, God, that you have given us the free pardon of our sins without any merit, without any righteousness of our own, without any keeping of the law. You've done those things for us because you love us. Thank you, Lord, for being abundant in mercy. Thank you, God, for loving us. Help us, dear God, to, number one, love you. Help us to love one another as we love you. And I pray, dear God, Lord, that you would make us fit disciples for your kingdom. Father, we pray for those who could not be here tonight. We ask you, God, to visit with them and bless them tonight. And Father, Lord, for those that are always with us online, I pray, dear God, Lord, that you would give them grace and comfort as well. Let tonight's service and the study we do in your word be a blessing to all. But Father, remind us, dear God, that this life is very short. It could be taken away from us just in a moment. We could be alive one minute, standing before you the next. I pray, dear God, that the reality of that would sink into our hearts tonight. We would understand, God, that there is one reason to live and to do the things we do on this earth only. One reason only. And that is, Father, to live for you because we know we are going to stand before you in judgment. We ask, dear God, for your mercy, your grace, your blessings. Fill our hearts and our minds with your word, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Now, in John chapter 5, remember they... Uh, they have questioned Jesus about calling himself equal with God or making himself equal with God. Uh, they've, they've sort of chastised him over the issue of healing on the Sabbath day or doing good deeds on the Sabbath day. And they're really, there's, there's those who are working against him and there are those who are listening to him and they're being blessed by him. And Jesus was exactly the kind of savior that they needed. And I look at the time that they live in, at, in this time, in, in the gospel days, similar to the times that we're living in right now. One of the things that I know and that I've seen as a trend and something that has benefited our church uh, in the last 12 years, since 2009 when I started doing the Watchman broadcast and we started broadcasting our sermons online and whatnot and doing everything that we do online is that people have gotten sick and tired of denominations large church ministries or whatever they, they've gotten tired of that type of organized religion that tells them what they must believe what they must say how they must live how they must walk, how they must dress, how they must comb their hair, how, what they can and cannot watch on television and things like that. Now, I believe in morality issues. I believe that there is a biblical way to dress. In fact, let me give you something. That I, haven't, I haven't talked about this in years. Did you know that there is actually a biblical, biblically defined standard as to what part of your legs are to be covered that denotes what modesty is and what is immodest or shameful. There's actually two places in scripture. There's one in Isaiah and then there's one in the Levitical law. In the law, God told the, the, that the high priest, along with the robes and the, and the breastplate that he was to wear with the ephod and the, and the, uh, the mitre that he was supposed to wear, they made him a, a set of linen breeches, they called them, breeches, we would say, pants. And the Bible said that they were to go from his waist down to his knees to cover his thighs so that his, when he went and did whatever service he did, and if he had to step on any steps or whatever, that the shame of his nakedness would not appear. In other words, covering the thighs was counted as if you had your thighs uncovered, that was a shame. There is a reference in the book of Isaiah, and I haven't studied this out in a while, so I don't know the exact verse, but it's a cry out to Babylon uh, that she 
make bare the thigh and uncover her shame. And so you have two witnesses in the Bible that tells you that covering the thigh is basically how God wants us. If you're, if you're deciding on what dress to wear or how long shorts are, and when you start telling people they can wear short shorts, you know some people will take that and, and wear short shorts. Okay? Especially teenage girls. Okay? They'll stretch that, they'll stretch that and, 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 and bend rules so they can get by with that. But God actually, I mean, to me, I know where my thigh ends and my thigh starts. Right above my kneecap. God said, cover that up. And that's his version of modesty. Okay? So anyway, aside from that. But anyway, what I've seen over the last several years is people who were genuinely born again, saved by God's grace, being constantly told by a denomination or by an overbearing church that they were never good enough, they had not given enough money, one pastor I had heard, uh, people wrote to me and said that their pastor, he had his inner circle of people and they all sat toward the front. And the pastor basically said, there are people in this church who are closer to God than others and it has everything to do with where they sit. And the people that only come on Sunday mornings, they usually sit toward the back and the people who come every service, they usually sit toward the front. And they're, they're more closer to God than everybody else is. And God blesses them better than... And I'm just going, no! If the blessings at, and the grace of God is given to us without merit, then why is it then that where I sit and how often I sit there determines how well God will bless me? It doesn't. So, amen. So what's happened is people have have been coming out of that. And Jesus was dealing with the exact same situation here. With the Pharisees having a lockdown on what the people did, how they did it, how they lived, overbearing in their lives, putting rules and burdens upon them that they themselves would not bear. Remember when they brought the woman caught in adultery. And the question always was, Jim, where was the guy she was with? It takes two to tango. Where was the guy? It was obviously either one of those men or they were covering his tracks, dragging the woman out and they were telling the guy, you get out the back door, we'll take care of the woman so that she doesn't talk. I mean, that's clear to me. So the religious hierarchy was creating a corruption and a corrupt system exactly the way it is now. And because we've been able to reach out and find people that like our message, like the Bible we use and so on, uh, we've been able to be a blessing to those people. So the thing that used to be 2,000 years ago, it's the same thing that is going on exactly right now. People are sick and tired of corruption in politics. And yes, Joe Biden's an idiot for allowing the Taliban to take back control over a nation that used to be stable. He's an idiot. And I haven't been following the news much, but I heard that one and I just went, mm mm. The people are sick and tired of the corruption in the politics. They're tired of the corruption in business. They're tired of the corruption in churches as well. And so Jesus in verse 19, here's what he says. In fact, let's go back to 17. There's a paragraph marker there. John chapter 5, verse 17. But Jesus answered them, My father worketh hitherto, and I work. Therefore the Jews sought more to kill him, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, The Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. And then think about that. Matthew, think about that. Those two boys. Don't they watch you when you do stuff? They watch you. They sit there and watch daddy do his work. Or whatever daddy does, they watch it and they mimic that. It's like, I've got a scar right here. Because I used to stand and watch my dad shave with one of them old 
one blade razors. You know, you took the blade and screwed the bottom of it up. And mom kept telling him, you better put that razor away. I'm telling you, that boy's going to use that. Oh, Judy, he ain't either. My boy's not that dumb. Yes, I am, Dad. Still am. And I remember Dad left, and I walked in the bathroom, and I picked that thing up, and I went, slice, blood shooting all down my face. I have a scar to this day. I watched my dad. Amen. That's what you're supposed to do, right? Um, but, yeah, I went up instead of down. I went sideways what I did. The sun, watch this now. The sun, verse 19, the son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the father do. For whatsoever things he doeth, or what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the son likewise. For the father loveth the son. Don't you grasp this? And sheweth him all things that himself doeth. This goes to my idea that I do believe that Jesus more than likely has access to the day and the hour of his coming. Because I can't see the Father withholding that from him now that he's at the right hand of the Father and all things have been given into his hand. He showeth him all things that himself doeth. He, and he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. For as the Father raiseth up the dead and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. The word quicken means to make alive. The word quick or quickly means lively. Like you're, act like you're alive. And so when someone acts like they're alive, they're, they're running real fast, not moving to where you can't see them move. Even so the son quickeneth whom he will. For the father, watch this now, for the father judgeth no man, but he hath committed all judgment unto the son. Now, I want you to grasp this. We're not, when we stand in judgment, we're not going to be standing in front of some Harvard judge who speaks over your head and has never lived the kind of life you live and has never dealt with poverty, he's never dealt with any harm or anything like that because his family's rich and he's been well taken care of and he's just lived a whole lot better life than everybody else. We're not dealing with somebody like that. We're dealing with somebody who came down here, born of a poor family, lived a life of poverty, suffered as we suffer. He suffered the loss of loved ones. He wept at Lazarus' tomb. He suffered pain and agony and torture at the hands of Roman soldiers at the, at the, at, at the cross. He has suffered as much or more than any man has suffered. He knows what it's like to be tempted. He knows what it's like to go through and be hungry. He knows what it's like to be thirsty. He knows, he knows all the frailties of humanity. Who better to judge us? One of the things that the Constitution writers did right in framing our Constitution, there's a lot of things in the Constitution that are right. One of them is, is that every man has the right to be judged by a jury of, the word is peers. In other words, his equals, his common citizen friends, people who are the same kind of person that he is. They've worked the same kind of work. They live in the same neighborhood. They have the same values, the same morals, the same type of upbringing. When, when there was a famine in that area, they all went through the famine. In other words, he is being judged by people who can understand what he's been through in his life. And I like that. Instead of being judged by some uppity tribunal of men who have no mercy and have no understanding of how hard life really is, you're being judged by people who understand you. A woman who may have killed her husband because she got tired of being beat on. She has a right to be judged by other women who possibly have been beaten by a spouse. And you know what? It's possible 
that she may either get off or get a lesser sentence because of it, because she's being judged by people who understand her. And when he says here that the father judges no man, but he has committed all judgment into the son, I like that. Because Christ has been down here and he knows. Now, since Jesus is still God, can you bribe the judge? No. Nope. Since he loves everybody, red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Does Jesus care what family you came from? No. Nope. Does he care what he owns the cattle on a thousand hills? Do you think he cares how much money you have? No. It has nothing to do with that. He is going to judge with absolute perfect equity. Um, verse 23, that all men should honor the son, even as they honor the father. He that honoreth not the son, honoreth not the father, which has sent him. Uh, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word uh, and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Now in verse 25, verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the son of God and they that hear shall live. I believe he's speaking of the resurrection. There is two resurrections. There is the first resurrection, which we commonly call the rapture. That's 1 Corinthians 15, 51, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, and among other places. But because we have been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, we have been born again then we escape condemnation and in the first resurrection when the trumpet sounds all of the dead who have died in faith believing and trusting in God I believe since the days of Adam they will come up out of the grave no matter where they are or out of the sea no matter what part of the sea their their carcass has been in and by the way you don't have to embalm bodies not according to God embalming's not part of God's law if the body turns to dust it turns to dust if the body turns to ash it turns to ash if you happen to have died on a boat over uh, coming over on the Mayflower and they dumped your body into the sea and the sharks ate you God still is going to resurrect your body amen um, some people don't believe that, but I just can't help it. It doesn't matter the, the condition of your body. Never, never prohibits God from resurrecting. Never does. So, that's the first resurrection. But then there's the second resurrection. And we'll get into that in a little bit. So he says... Um, the hour is coming now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and they that hear shall live. Verse 26. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. So just like my Father passed on to me many of his traits, some good, some not so good. I've handed them down to Matthew, some good, some not so good. The father is handed down to his son of himself as well. So if the father can give life, the son now can give life. And he hath given him authority, verse 27, to execute judgment also, because he is the son of man. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, that's the first resurrection, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation, that's the second resurrection. Now let's turn, uh, before we turn to Revelation, turn to Isaiah. I just had a thought. Flash. This just in from the Holy Spirit. 
A news flash. Isaiah 66. Turn there. I was asked this question one time at a Q&A I did at a church and there were some women that had some really wacky beliefs and they didn't believe a word I said. Um, they were of the opinion that God isn't going to make a brand new earth. He's just going to coat over this earth with a new skin or something. It was weird. Yeah, it was weird. Um, look at verse 22, Isaiah 66, 22. For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. Now this is in the new earth, new Jerusalem, new heaven, everything's new. Verse 24, and they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me. For their worms shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched, and they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. And here's what I believe. I believe that those of us who are born again, when we are in the new heaven, the new earth, Jerusalem has come down from heaven prepared as a bride adorned for her husband, God the Father himself now can dwell among us. We shall see his face. And we will live in a perfect, perfected government, a perfect state. There will be no need for policemen. There will be no need for riot gear. There will be no need for anything else. No need for hospitals and doctors and life insurance. We will, be, we will see the lake of fire. We will see it. And I believe according to this, that we will see the people who are in it, the lake of fire. Those that have transgressed against God. Their carcasses are going to be in there. Now, this is what I was questioned on. How can they have carcasses when, you know, it's their soul that's cast in there? They, they didn't add what God's going to do at the second resurrection. They left that out. And when you leave part of Scripture out, it doesn't make sense. When you add enough of relevant Scripture, then it starts to make sense in your mind. So I believe that we will see... Those who have departed and died without Christ, even our loved ones, we will see them in there. Now, it won't bother us because we will be in a perfected state. We will not sorrow. No tears will come to our eyes. And so we won't be going, oh, I wish Aunt Hazel could come. We won't be doing that. Okay. It will be an abhorring to us, but I think it's there probably for a reason. We'll turn around and say, God, thank you that I'm here. Now, turn to Revelation 20. Revelation 20. This is the second resurrection. The second resurrection. Verse 11, and I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. Does that leave anybody out? Do do queens and kings have to stand before God in judgment? So the queen, Prince, um, Prince Philip, her husband, just died recently. Even though he's the prince, 
sits on a royal throne in Buckingham Palace, pays no taxes. When he died, he had to stand before the king of kings. Because even kings have a king over them. His name is Jesus Christ. So it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter who you are. And when they talk about royal blood, there is no such thing as far as God is concerned. It's blood. And they were made out of dirt just like everybody else was. And the, so I, they stand before God and the books were opened. That's the books of all the things that you thought and did. All the laws of God that you broke. Everything's written down. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Now, here's the difference between them and us. The Bible says the just shall live by faith. We are judged according to our faith. But because they refused Christ's offer of salvation, atonement, forgiveness of sins, then they are going to be judged not according to faith because they had none. They did not. They, they chose to reject God's free gift of salvation. They are going to be judged on their works. And their works are the things that are written down in those books. Every page full of everything that that person did in their life that was a violation of God's law. You can call it God's rap sheet. Because it's a list of charges against that person. How many charges do they need in order to be found guilty? Just one. I watched a documentary the other day. It was on the mafia boss bosses back in, during the 80s. And these five Italian families basically ran New York City back then. And that's when... Uh, Trump was really getting started building and everything like that. And he had to deal with these guys. But then Rudy Giuliani became the uh, Southern District prosecuting attorney. And he went and was trained in how to use the RICO laws that were written. They were written like 10 years ago and nobody ever used them because they didn't know how. But basically it said that these, these mafia families run crime as a family business that that's how they could get to the mafia bosses so they brought in they arrested the top five heads of the five mafia families arrested them all in one day had had a a hearing for them had a trial for them and they had i don't like 150 charges against each one of them on the first charge, they were all five found guilty. That in itself got them a hundred years in prison. Now, most of these guys were already in their 60s and 70s. Okay? A hundred years in prison. Are they getting out? Nope. Every one of them died in prison. Okay? So just the one, the first count that they read, when they said, when the jury said guilty, Everybody breathes a sigh of relief. We got them. But they had to go through the, all the hundred, other 150 charges that they had against them. Guilty, 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 guilty. So they kept adding in all these charges with all these other jail terms associated with them. But the bottom line is, just one was enough. You understand what I'm saying? When you try to tell yourself, I am a fairly good person. I only do wrong every now and then. You've just indicted yourself against God. You've said, God, I did wrong. And that one sin basically means death for you. Now, verse 13. The sea gave up the dead which were in it. 
So everybody who has died at sea, had a burial at sea, everybody whose ashes have been dumped in the sea, the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. If you look up um, at verse 5, this chapter. The rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So there it talks about the second death. Um, trying to see where it talked about the... Uh, Second resurrection. Well, basically, when the Bible says when the sea gave up their dead and so on, here's what God is doing. With us, when in the first resurrection, God is going to give us a brand new body. That body is going to be holy. It's going to be completely without sin. It's going to be without pain. It's going to be without any suffering. And it is going to last forever. The second resurrection, those, saint, those people who have died in their sins, they will receive a new body, a resurrection body. This is the carcasses that were mentioned back in Isaiah 66, 20, whatever, 22. Their carcasses are the new body that they have been given. That body is designed, watch this, to suffer enormous amounts of pain without passing out. See, right now your body has a limit. There's a limit at how much pain you can endure. And when you've reached that limit, you go into shock or you'll, you'll just pass out. And I think that second body that God gives those who are appointed to the lake of fire... God has removed those restrictions. And that body will suffer immense pain for eternity in the lake of fire. And those of us who are in heaven, I believe, will look and say, thank you, God. Thank you that that's not me. In fact, you could say it now. Thank you, God. Thank you that that is not me. So I, I just, sometimes I think about being in hell. I do not want to go there. What are they judged against? Are they judged against man's laws? If man says this is the sin, if this is wrong, are they going to be judged on that? What are they, what... What law will they be judged by? God's law. So if God said, thou shalt not steal, and you've stolen, then it will be God who will judge you by that law alone. If God said, thou shalt not covet, and you've coveted, you will be judged by that law and only that law. If God said, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. If God said, thou shalt not commit adultery. The adulteration of marriage. Thou shalt not commit adultery. If you've committed adultery, you will be judged on the basis of that sin. And it's God's law, not man's law. So while everybody says, yes, I, I don't want, man, man, you can't judge me. You're judging me. You're not supposed to judge me. Okay, fine. But just know that one of these days, God is going to judge you. And there is no such thing as balances. 
that weigh your good deeds against your bad deeds. Because in Ezekiel 33, God says that in the day that a righteous man committeth iniquity, all of his righteousnesses are gone. So now what does he have left? Just iniquity. And how many would it take on a set of empty scales, how many sins would it take to offset the balance? Just one. And outside of every courtroom in America, there's a statue of a woman with a blindfold holding a set of balances. Okay? Even our, even our courts are supposed to run that way. They're supposed to run on equity. If someone has transgressed the law and committed a murder, then the scales of justice must be equal to the crime they committed. Does that make sense to everybody? And in this case, if a man offends the law in one point, James said he is guilty of, of the whole law. Breaking the entire law. You broke the law. On a lease agreement, if you're renting a house or a mobile home, on that lease agreement, how many things on there can violate your lease? Just one thing. Lease says no dogs and you brought a dog in. Landlord comes by, sees a dog in there and he says, I'm giving you 30 days to get out. You broke the lease. You say, is that, you mean that's it? He can do it just, yeah, that's what the lease said. Just on that one thing, that's how it is. And, in, and so many people have a wrong idea of how God judges everybody's sins. But it's on the basis of what you did, you and you alone. God's not going to judge you on what somebody else did. He's going to judge you on what you did, you alone. That in itself is enough for me to say to God, I would never stand up and be righteous in God's courtroom. Never. Therefore, I must have redemption. I must have my sins blotted out on God's record so that I stand before God clean, as clean as Jesus stands before him. That's God's judgment, and it is coming. It is appointed unto man once to die. And after this, the judgment. Which is why I believe some people choose not to believe in God. If they choose not to believe in God, then there will be no judgment. Which means, basically, then they can get by with anything they want to. And our whole morality system, marriage, not killing innocent people... So not taking someone else's property, so on and so forth. All of those are based upon God's laws. Man would never come up with those laws on his own. God came up with those laws to judge and rule over mankind with. And they're good laws, aren't they? If you're not stealing some, your neighbor's wife, it's because you love your neighbor. And you don't want to steal his wife. Amen? You love your neighbor more than you love your neighbor's wife. Amen. Amen.